right. If you have a Bible, uh, open up to um, Matthew 22. Matthew 22. And I'll explain momentarily. If you don't have a Bible, the folks walking down the aisles will give you one. Just raise your hand. And you're welcome to keep the Bible if you don't own one. And anyone tuning in online, if you don't have a Bible, let us know. We'll ship you one. Um, yeah, amen. And we want them to participate in communion too. It's, it's hard. I mean, they're, they're, they're living in a, a desert of good teaching and they've tuned in. They call this home and we want to make you feel as welcome as possible. So um, do communion with us the first Sunday of every month. And if you need a Bible, we'll send you one. Uh, a number of folks we correspond with. They send us letters. We, we try to respond to all the letters that we get to the best of our ability. So and any prayer requests, send those in too. All right. Okay, uh, before I have you stand for the reading of the word of the Lord, I just wanted to share with you, um, this is part of our anchored reading, and as I got to this passage, I, I, was, um, I was reminiscent of this and one other verse in the Bible was used against God's speak uh, during the pandemic uh, to try to silence us. And uh, it's a fascinating verse because it's anything but... Uh, ammunition to silence us. It just, it made me more committed to do what we did and we'll do it again if we have to. Um, so so we're gonna, and some of you are like, wow, what is the verse? It's super exciting. Well, it's Jesus saying you have to pay taxes. <laughs> You're like, dang it. <laughs> In California, that's like, you know, you have to give an organ of your body to, but uh, it's more than that, far more than that. He is distinguishing um, exactly what he intends for us, especially uh, involved in, in what is Caesar's and what the kingdom of God does in the realm of Caesar. Uh, Caesar is uh, a subject to Christ. If he walks into the church, any leader walks into the church, they're not the head of the church. They're, they're subjects to Christ. And, um, and that, that's one of the reasons why Scottish Covenanters uh, were massacred in the grass market in Edinburgh because they said that the king was a subject of Christ. He wasn't the head of the church. Christ was. And they, the king killed them all. Um, as a matter of fact, 70% of the Revolutionary War generals were Scottish Covenanters because they had already faced the persecution in Scotland. They immigrated to Ireland. They were kicked out of there. They were pursued there in Ireland, Northern Ireland. They ended up in America, and they finally just said, look, you kicked us out of Scotland. We got kicked out of Ireland. We're not leaving. And they stood their ground. And so you are recipients of almost 250 years of unprecedented freedom by the efforts of those who were inspired by ministers. One in particular um, it was Samuel Rutherford wrote a, a book. He was a Scottish covenanter called Lex Rex, where he described that all are subjects of Christ. He is the head of the church, and he rules in the affairs of men. And, uh, and as we see in this chapter, chapter 22, uh, it goes further down, and it talks about how God judges nations. And it's important that he states that, because nations will be judged. And you think, how does a nation judge? Well, we're, as I've said before, we're judged individually whether or not uh, Christ's blood covers the multitude of our sins and that he's our savior and we've received his free gift of salvation. By the way, I always make the mistake. I was w watching the song where it said, grace so free. It's not free. And, and salvation isn't free. Somebody had to pay for it. When I was a young boy throwing a ball against the wall of my neighbor's house or garage, I missed and I hit their window. And I ran in the house and hid. And then Mr. Glard, the owner, came next door. My dad you know, answers the door and he says, uh, at the time my dad was a commander, he said, Commander McCoy, your son broke my window. And, and, you know, I, and, and he, was, he was a wealthy man. And he said, you know, I, I can pay for the window, but it's the third time it's been broken. And somebody's, he, you know, they, they need to learn a lesson that this isn't free. And my dad said, I agree with you. He said, my son doesn't have the ability to pay for it. I'll pay for it. And then my dad taught me a lesson. Um, he was very patriotic. He'd lay down stripes, I'd see stars. It was really <laughs> tremendous. Now, my dad wouldn't that way, but it was, it was, um, it, it was a lesson for me because I learned this simple lesson. Somebody has to pay. Everything costs. Even the acronym for using grace is an acronym. God's riches at Christ's expense. You, you get grace without a cost, but, but it came at a cost. Christ paid for it. You know, when, when, when we're kids and we're given something, it cost our parents something. 
And this is important because we're going to be talking about monetary issues of taxes and inscriptions on coinage that is run by the government. And we're going to we're going to address the issue of what is money and, and why governments are, are um, given the responsibility of, of currency exchange. And so, it, you know, even, even salvation isn't free. Christ went up the Via Dolorosa, the way of pain. He, he was beaten. He was, he, he was spit upon. He was crucified. And, and that, that cost him. He paid the penalty for our sin. Now, for you and I, we, you know, it, we look at it, we say free, but it's not free. You have to remember the cost that was paid so that you could have access to it. He paid a price none of us could ever have paid. And so th- this is one of those things where we don't, we don't worship him out of obligation, but out of adoration. We obey him not out of uh, to be saved, but because we are saved. And, and this is critical because sometimes we just take stuff at granted. We go, oh, no, it, it, you know, it's like kids turning on the light at home. They don't worry about if the electric bill's paid. It's, you know, the light always works. And every time I open the refrigerator, there's more food. And I leave clothes on the floor and they miraculously are washed and folded. Yeah, it's, somebody's working their tail off to provide that for you. And you get used to that and then you become entitled. Well, where's my folded clothes that are laundered? Well, you're now, you know... A, a child of the law, but mitzvah, you're accountable to God. You do your own work. And, and that's, you know, if you're, if you're you know, helicoptering, your, parenting your kids and, and giving them all the time instead of teaching them the value of things, you're going to end up with a problem. You're going to end up with a, a, a huge problem. And, and I, I've had times in counseling where, where young men, women come in and, and, well, not women, but young men come in and they're, they're addicted and, 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 you know, I, I say, where do you get the money to buy that? Well, I live at home. And, and I, I, I tell the parents who want me to reach out and minister to their kids, I go, well, they're not the problem, you are. You're, you're, give, you're giving them shelter. Well, they'd be out on the streets. Well, that's, that's the consequences of your actions. Who are you to get in the way of what God wants to do to bring someone to the end of themselves? You know, if, if, if they have, if, if they, 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 they do that because they can. And some of you are going, well, that's kind of harsh. Well, I've, I've applied it with my own family. So don't, don't think that I'm, I'm giving you, you know, insight that I'm not applying myself. It's not easy. I'll agree with you. Michelle and I had sleepless nights, laboring in prayer, wondering are we going to hear from the coroner. And yet God would see it through. And, and those, are, those are the tough decisions in life. And, and, uh, and so this is all encapsulated in what we're about to take a look at. And you're like, really? Taxes won't do all that. <laughs> in spite of taxes, God still works mightily. So that's, we're going to pick up at verse 15. So please stand for the reading of the word of the Lord. I'll read out loud if you'll follow along silently. Then the Pharisees went and plotted how they might entangle Jesus in his talk. And they sent to him their disciples with the Herodians saying, Teacher, we know that you are true and teach the way of God in truth, nor do you care about anyone, for you do not regard the person of men. Tell us, therefore, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, Why do you test me, you hypocrites? He said, Show me... The tax money, by the way, here's a U.S. coin. Show me the tax money. So they brought him a denarius, which would be a day's wages. And he said to them, whose image and inscription is this? They said to him, it's Caesar's. And he said to them, render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. When they heard these words, they marveled and left him and went their way. So it it, it seems wise on the surface, which it is, but it's far more entailed and profound, and I pray it ministers to you and all who are in the hearing of my voice. Let's pray and ask God to do that. Lord, may man decrease that your spirit might increase, and Holy Spirit, please lead us into all truth. We thank you for your word, which is true. May we rightly divide it as workmen who are not ashamed that we would rightly divide the word of truth. Lord, I I pray your blessing upon the study of your word. I pray, Lord, that our hearts would be prepared to receive all that you would have for us. And we thank you, God, that you do rule in the affairs of men. 
And your people, who are of substance, have a power to sway Caesar and to establish those types of governments that in the end will be judged, but those governments that would give freedom to man to pursue all that you have desired for him. And so, Lord, please, we pray that there would be a new awakening in relation to all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, have a seat if you would. Somebody's phone's ringing. Appreciate if you'd answer it. We'll be patient while you talk. I, you do know that every seat in here is wired. And if your phone goes, we, we can shock you. So I'd, I'd encourage you to turn them off. Now, that first person had a warning. They were about ready. I saw them. And I was like winking at them during the prayer not to electrocute you. <laughs> this is a tough crowd. <laughs> you're like, well, you're just not funny. <laughs> well, in this passage of scripture that we've taken a look at, um, Jesus holds up a coin when they ask him, is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar? And he holds up a coin. And he said to them, whose image is, is on this coin? Now, um, this, this message was solidified yesterday. Uh, Michelle and I did a little bit of uh, grandkid sitting. Um, and we, we sat down with, with three of our five grandkids. And the two older ones were prepared for the lesson. The younger one, we, we knew he wouldn't quite comprehend it, although he's, he's brilliant. Um, he, he gets all of Micah's brains, the, my side of the family. We're trying to breed it out. <laughs> Molly's smart. She's a smart because she got Michelle's DNA. I'm talking about mine. We're trying to get that out. So, But uh, we, we sat down with them, and um, we'd asked them to help bring the groceries in that were at the doorstep. And... And they, they worked it, and we had two $1 bills as we had scoured our, our place for some cash. Oh, we had two, $2. And, <laughs> but we had three kids, but I had these coins. Uh, it's my favorite American coin. Well, one of them, I should say. Um, and, and actually, a friend of mine uh, who is just a tremendous gift giver, he came to me one day after I'd given him a steel penny, a 1943 steel penny, and he... he, uh, he he just says not to be outdone, and he comes with a handful of these 1964 Kennedy half dollars. I was born in 1964. Uh, it's meaningful to me. My great uncle had given me a, a roll of these, um, uh, and, and I, I just, I cherish them. And, um, and then he shared with me something that was so insightful, and, and had, I, had I thought about it, I would have gotten it, but, but he, he, he gave me a great lesson. He handed me the coin, and he said, you know, um, in 1964, this half dollar could buy a gallon of gasoline. <laughs> like, oh. He goes, guess what it can buy today? I'm like, not much. He goes, no, it can buy four or five gallons of gasoline. He goes, it's made out of pure silver. I'm like, wow. That's fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. So I'm sitting down with the three grandkids, and I knew the, the youngest one, Elliot, wouldn't quite comprehend it. So I put the $2 bills in front of him, and then I took the two half dollars, 64 Kennedy half dollars, and I put them in front of the older kids. And I said, you know, these are half dollars, this is a dollar, and this is a dollar. So to, to, to get $2, you have to have, you know, four of these to match what is in front of Elliot. And I, and I said, um, what... Which one would you prefer for your, your errands today? And they're like, um, well, those, the dollar, two dollars. And, and yet Liberty, uh, she's, she's a woman, she understands value. She said, no, no, that's silver. <laughs> <laughs> Women get precious metal. <laughs> and she says, that's silver. And I'm like, it is Liberty. She goes, it's valuable. I go, it is. And, and I explained it to them, and I said, but the problem is, if you go down to the Dollar Tree with the $2, you can buy some trinkety toy that'll last you about 19 seconds, or some candy that'll hype you for a, a tad bit and frustrate your parents, but we'll be giving you back to them. <laughs> I said, but this, you, you, you could spend at the Dollar Tree, but you're only going to get 50 cents worth of, uh, you couldn't even buy anything at the Dollar Tree. So... So this won't work in that store, but if you, if you find someone who understands its value, you can sell it for up to $20, $25. And they're like, wow. And I said, which do you want, Ellie? He goes, I want the $2. 
I want to go get that thing. Go. Yeah. And, and he was smart because, you know, immediate spending. But we talked about inflation and hyperinflation and how quantitative easing and we were using these terms the kids completely got it <laughs> but the idea of quantitative easing is where they just print more money and then they create a supply and demand and then prices increase and then you know you have more money on the market less goods to and and, and then you know the wealthy can afford it and the poor um, all their savings is wiped out because you know you're you're watching as money loses its value and, and then I said, the moral of the story, and the kids got it, and I said, the moral of the story, and I held this up, I said, ready? The moral of the story, pay attention, they got it, you need to get it. The moral of the story is, things of substance never lose their value. Now, the question is, are you men and women of substance? You see, the paper currency has no substance because those in charge of it mess with it. And it becomes less and less valuable. It used to be that we valued a penny because you could at least get something with it. Now if you see one on the ground, you just it's not even worth bending over to pick up. Remember Charles Barkley, the story goes, and told by a friend of his, he went into the men's restroom and he saw a quarter in the urinal and he reaches in his wallet and he pulls out a crisp $100 bill, crumbles it up and throws it in the urinal and then reaches in, grabs a $100 bill and the quarter. The guy goes, what are you doing? He goes, a quarter wasn't worth my time, but $100.25 was. <laughs> Funny man. Things of substance never lose their value. As a matter of fact, they increase in value, especially in a world that causes that which we need to barter and operate with as those in charge mess with the freedoms of men and play games with that which they've worked hard to obtain. People gravitate towards things of substance. Now, one more thing before we begin the lesson. What is money? Some have heard the lesson, but I'll make it very simple. Money is not what you need to buy things with. Money is a representation of your contribution to society. You mow Widow Johnson's yard, you get $20 for that, that act, for that work. You go and you wanna buy on-cloud shoes, I think they're, what, let's just say 100 bucks. And you take that $20, you go to the shoe store, and the owner of the shoe store says, I know you want the on-cloud shoes, but you're gonna need to mow Widow Johnson's yard four more times because that's your contribution to society, and then you can buy that which you like. So you go and you do that, and now you value the shoes you purchased because you see the contribution, and now you're rewarded for that contribution by your efforts. If you have no money, it's because you've made no contribution to society. Some of you have made contributions to society. Government hasn't, but they've taken that. Caesar's taken your money. They don't do anything. I mean, seriously, you, you, you go to a restaurant, you pay for the meal, you go to pay the bill, and you look at the tax. They didn't show up. They didn't serve anything. They didn't do anything. And they, they got paid. You know, well, they provided the roads. and the, it, I paid gas tax for that. Income tax for that. Sales tax for that. Death tax for that. Ad nauseum. They tax everything. You're going, you're coming, you're staying, they, they tax it. Breathing, taxed. Everything is taxed. They don't show up, they don't, but they tax you. And they get bigger and bigger. They get nice pensions that no one else gets. And then they spike it at the end where they hold back their their. their vacation pay and their uniform allowance and then and they cash it in all in the last year and they're able to spike their salary and then retire on the exact same of money that they were making while they were still working. So now when we want to hire somebody in government that, that retires on full salary, now we have to pay them and bring someone else in to do the job that they're no longer doing. So now it costs us twice as much to keep one person employed for protection of, of criminals wanting to, you know, invade our, 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 our 
privacy or, or steal our, our property. We have to pay twice as much for fire protection. And then it's unsustainable. And we watch businesses implode. And, and I, I, I watched Governor Newsom on a Zoom call. I don't know if you saw this. And he commented, and, and I will, I'm going to go on record right now, and Governor, you prove me wrong, and I will do my homework if you are willing to put names forward and locations forward, and I will, I will apologize publicly and correct it, but I sincerely believe you to be lying. He said he went into a Target store. The governor of California stood in line at a Target store. He's telling the story on a Zoom call. And the clerk witnessed someone stealing and walked out the door and did nothing. And he asked them, why didn't you stop them? And the clerk with their head down said, because Governor Newsom's laws. And in his story, which is only a story a narcissist could tell, they looked up and realized it was the governor with his perfect hair. And he's telling the Zoom, they, they wanted a picture with me, which is what a narcissist would say. And I said, no. And I want to speak to your manager because I'm going to blame him for my failure by accusing you of your misquoting my concerns for the state I oversee. And then he meets with the, the store manager, berates the clerk, and he he uses that as an opportunity for his talking points on why California isn't a place for theft. <laughs> it sounded similar to President Biden telling us the economy is booming. <laughs> we all feel it. But then when you dig into Proposition 47 and you look at it, everything he's saying is a talking point and you know what bugs me the most? The media didn't investigate the story. You, if you could find that clerk, they'd be on the front page of every paper, ridiculed and mocked. And the store manager in the store he went to as governor of California standing in a line at Target. <laughs> I, I find him more suitable for the French laundry during COVID than in a Target store in line, berating an hourly employee. And you look at this, and, 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 and the law in California, Proposition 47, anything, it's just close to $1,000, is considered a misdemeanor. Now, a misdemeanor, they don't send their employees after someone who's stolen less than $1,000 because their life would be on the line, and even if they apprehended them, the police officer would have to have witnessed it. And they're going to put their life on the line for something that would be considered a misdemeanor. And with a the misdemeanor, they're just going to get a citation and in most, most cities in California that have district attorneys that are Soros-funded and elected, the case would be dropped anyways. What some stores do is they buy facial recognition programs so that they can see this same perpetrator coming in and coming in and coming in and calculating and adding it up and then presenting the data. And even if the officer arrests them, the likelihood is they will not be prosecuted. And they've invested countless amounts of money, and most small businesses can't afford facial recognition. So whatever the governor was telling the people on a Zoom call was self-serving, and it was a story that was completely made up. And if I'm wrong, please, governor, show me the clerk, the store manager, and the store, and then we'll do our investigative research to see if what you're saying is true. And the reason why I point that out is because Caesar is destroying small businesses. Now, what do we do as Christians? Do we just roll over and take it? As we're watching DEI imposed in corporations, diversity, equity, inclusion, and we're watching that they don't hire the best. And as I said before, especially with the airlines where we've had so many near misses that have increased almost fourfold, the controls of an airplane don't care about your sexual preference or your melanin content. And yet corporations are all concerned with that. Not your safety as citizens. And this is imposed that there's quotas required by the government. Is that Caesar's role? 
Is it Caesar's role to take your tax dollars and provide puberty blockers for children against the will of the parents? Is it government's role to provide free health care for non-citizens? Is it government's, you, you can see where, where, where is enough enough? Do you render unto Caesar what is Caesar? So when we were contending against the county and the governor, when he said the church was non-essential, we still rendered unto Caesar in the sense that he threatened or they threatened a thousand, me and a thousand congregants or visitors, and I still have on my record two contempt charges that have never been dismissed. Now, did I not render unto Caesar's what is Caesar's? I went to the court. I accepted whatever they gave me. I considered it an honor. It's kind of like they gave me a promotion. <laughs> but I, 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 I operated within the context, but I stood in defiance, and I took the consequences of that. Now, what did that do? It inspired others to do the same. I was inspired by others to do what I did. One in particular that I was inspired by was a man who had been dead since 1766, Jonathan Mayhew. I came across his writings and I realized, thank you, God. You see, they use this passage that we, we just read and Romans 13 to berate, pastors did around the country, berate us, me, into submission. And so it's, it's, it, government is unlimited submission. That if, if they are going to declare the church non-essential, if they want to shut us during uh, a supposed pandemic, scamdemic, if, that, if they want to do that, I must submit because I am, I am not loving my neighbor. I'm in disobedience to the authorities that God has appointed. Huh. And what did we see during this? Rendering unto Caesar what is Caesar's, and we apply that passage at its unlimited submission, what did we see? We saw the largest transference of wealth in the history of our country, almost 250 years. And it went all to big pharma. I mean, just turn on the television, tell me what ads you see. And, 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 and the ancillary effects of the shot itself, they're capitalizing on with everything they've caused, with all new kinds of, you know, shots and drugs that you're supposed to take. And, and just the bottom line is, you know, bloody stools and, and loss of life and, you know, you just go down the list and heart attack and, you know, and you're like, blah, 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 blah. you can't even read it fast enough. You're like, I can't wait to take that. <laughs> is that to render unto Caesar what is Caesar's? Is that what God intended us to do? I submit, no, as I believe the scriptures do as well. You see, the Herodians and the others, the Pharisees, Sadducees, gathered to try to trip Jesus up. And, and they, they, they plotted how they might entangle him in his talk, because Jesus was threatening their power. He was threatening their power. They, they don't, they're not concerned with truth. Matter of fact, we heard him call them hypocrites. We're gonna cover that momentarily. You've heard my definition of hypocrite, what Jesus considers to be a hypocrite. Jesus had been directly accusing and exposing these religious leaders, and now they're fighting back. And this is what Barclay says. He says, now we see the Jewish leaders launching their counterattack, and they do so by directing at Jesus, carefully formulated questions. How do we separate his authority, his power? How can we divide him from the people? And, 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 and they hated the oppression of Rome. And they, they loved God. How's he gonna get out of this one? We got him trapped. And then they begin to flatter him. And by the way, flattery is what you'd say to someone's face that you wouldn't say behind their back. Gossip is what you'd say behind their back that you wouldn't say to their face. They're both evil. They begin to flatter Jesus. They don't believe a word that they're saying. We know that you are true and teach the way of God in truth. Nor do you care about anyone for you do not regard the person of men. The compliment besides being treacherous was insulting, implying that Jesus was a reckless simpleton who would give himself away and a vain man who could be flattered. And then they ask the question now that they have tried to butter him up with flattery. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? And we got you now, smart man. Jesus' dilemma with this question was simple. 
If he said that taxes should be paid, he could be accused of denying the sovereignty of God over Israel, making himself unpopular with the Jewish people. If he said that taxes should not be paid, he made himself an enemy of Rome and he would be hung for it. This particular tax was the poll tax. Paying the poll tax was the most obvious sign of submission to Rome. Zealots claimed the poll tax was God dishonoring badge of slavery to the pagans. Even the religious community was divided over you pay taxes or not. But Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, why do you test me, you hypocrites? Now let me just pause there. Hypocrites. Let me tell you what a hypocrite isn't. Someone who says one thing and does the opposite. I'll I'll show you you're all hypocrites if that's the definition. How many of you have a sin that you struggle with that you said, I swear I'll never do that again? And how many of you did it again? Raise your hand. I think it's easier since we saw those hands. For those of you who are perfect, would you please (laughs) let us see who you are? How many of you made New Year's resolutions that you failed to accomplish? Raise your hands. Oh, come on. (laughs) All right, how many of you have succeeded in every New Year's resolution you've ever set for yourself? Raise your hand so we can laugh at you. (laughs) I wouldn't laugh at you. Well, I probably would. (laughs) But the idea is we all struggle. That doesn't make us hypocrites. We set a goal for ourselves, and we fail to obtain it. Jesus' definition of hypocrite was wholly different. His was someone who knows the truth but is consumed with holding power, so they deliberately steer people away from the truth to maintain their power, i.e., censorship and propaganda. That is a hypocrite. Two separate justice systems, hypocrite. They're changing the rules for the sake of maintaining their power. You can be a pro-Hamas, shake the gates and breach the gates of the White House and no arrests are made. You show up at a peaceful protest and if you were in Washington, you will be arrested. Two separate justice systems, hypocrisy the attempt to maintain power. They're gonna do the same thing down at the Mexican border. It'll be another January 6th roundup. They're trying. But Texas, and and they don't have facial recognition cameras, is gonna be interesting. It's gonna be a hard one. And and they're not gonna be able to, you know, they own Washington, so the attempt to to arrest people, they've got the the executive branch, they own both police forces, the Capitol Police Force, the the D.C. police, they own the prisons, they own the judges. They can do that in Washington, and, and it's the most facial recognition a capable city in America. Try doing that in Texas. You're not going to get your prosecutions. You're not gonna, they're not going to acquiesce. They, they won't yield. Yeah. So Jesus, as they have laid this out, they think they've caught him. And he, 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 he asks, he takes a, a denarii, and he says, whose image and inscription is this? Uh, Caesar's? Yeah, Caesar's. He says, render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. Jesus affirmed the government makes legitimate requests of us. We're responsible to God in all things, but we must be obedient to government in matters civil and national and more. Peter said it like this in 1 Peter 2, fear God and honor the king. Barclay says every Christian has double citizenship. He is a citizen of the country in which he happens to live. To it, he owes many things. He owes the safety against lawless men, which only a settled government can give. He owes all public services. France says render generally means give back, where, whereas the verb they had used in verse 17 was simple, give. It's the verb for paying a bill or settle, uh, settling a debt. They owe it to him. They provided for the roads. They provided for the police protection. You render to them in order to do that. When they overstep their boundaries, because our founders defined the extent of government, they said in our birth certificate, for this reason, governments were instituted among men. And you see it in context, it means to protect inalienable rights given to us by God. Ooh, 
Now you're mixing Caesar with God. Church and state. Well, that's our birth certificate. Welcome to the United States of America. That's what our founders designated and did. And you've lived in the freest nation for almost, we've existed for almost 250 years. And, and this is what it means to be an American citizen. Now, if you don't believe in the sovereignty of man or the freedom of man in a bottom-up government of a constitutional republic and you want an oligarchy and you want to see people not as equals but as serfs, this is how you do it. Frederick Douglass said, education and slavery cannot exist together. So instead of educating our children, we indoctrinate them and they become useful idiots and slaves to the system. And then we turn those children upon their parents. We take them. We, we, we distort the word of God where it says in Genesis 1.27 that in the beginning God created them male and female. In his image, he created them male and female. And we distort that, separate them from God, separate them from the parents, separate the family issue. And now they become subjects and serfs and slave to serve the elite. Is that how to render unto Caesar what is Caesar's? Is that willful submission to give your children to the state? The Bible said children are a blessing from the Lord. Blessed is a man whose quiver is full that the Bible says we're stewards of our children's lives, not the state. Is it unlimited submission to the state? Is that what we're called to do, to render unto Caesar unlimited submission to the state, give our children over? Even if under 15 and even older, that they're, they don't need parents' permission to get hormone blockers, which are considered inhumane for serial rapists in prison, but we can give them to children and mutilate their bodies? Is that submission and rendering unto Caesar what is Caesar's? Well, don't forget, on the coin, yes, is an inscription of Caesar. But the Bible says you and I have been created in the image of God. The image on our lives is God. We're his. Render unto God what is God's. Our children belong to the Lord, not to the state. And he's entrusted them to us as stewards. We'll be of an accounting of our, of, of our stewardship to the Lord. Did we give them over to Caesar? Are we shocked that they become Romans? That's not what the passage meant. That's not what God intended. That's not what Jesus was speaking. He says, unto God, the things that are God's, everyone has the image of God impressed upon them. This means that we belong to God, not to Caesar, not even to ourselves. My life is not my own. I've been purchased with a price. I am his. I'll give an accounting of my life. I'll stand before God. All of us will. It doesn't, listen, it doesn't matter if you don't believe in God. The Bible says it's appointed once for a man to die, then judgment. You'll stand before God and you'll give an accounting of your life. It doesn't matter if you don't believe he exists. It's just as stupid as believing that gravity doesn't exist. But you know what? Gravity doesn't care. The only difference between gravity and God is God does care. He would want that none would perish, but that all would be saved. He's pursuing you. The fact that you're here, someone loves you enough to bring you. By treating them as distinct, Jesus said, in effect, the kingdom of God is not of this world. It is possible to be a true citizen of the kingdom, yet quietly submit to the civil rule of, of a foreign potentate. It establishes limits, regulates rights, distinguishes jurisdictions. The two empires of heaven and earth, the image of princes stamped on their coins denotes temporal things belong to all their government. The image of God stamped on the soul denotes that all faculties and powers belong to the most high and should be employed in his service. In addition, chapter 22 goes on to talk about that nations will be judged. Nations will be judged on whether or not their citizens have access to truth or are they slaves and serfs as they are in North Korea. Can you pursue truth? Do you have the freedom of speech? Do you... Do you see the government protecting those inalienable rights given to you by God, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, which is the highest virtue, which means you accomplish that for what you were designed to do? If the governments don't do that, they will be judged, and so will its citizens. Those in Germany who stood in the Nuremberg trials who said, I was just following orders, they were hung. 
You can't use that as an excuse while you watch millions of people being gassed and incinerated, shot and hung. You stand before God. You're judged, and, 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 the, and the world judged that. We can't stand idly by and, and allow what's occurring in our schools and say as Christians, I, I just preach the gospel. That doesn't work. You and I are men and women of substance. The value we possess is our willingness to contend for truth at every level for the sake of our neighbor who we're to love more than ourselves. For God so loved the world, he gave his only son. We too give our lives for the sake of our neighbors. Not that we love God, but that he first loved us while we were yet sinners. We contend for those who hate us. A a missionary goes where he's not loved but needed and leaves when he's no longer needed but loved. This is substance. Truth is substance. And the only way that you can avoid that in the church is to redefine what your idea of truth is. And so the church, in its unwillingness to confront evil and to contend with a Caesar who's overstepped their bounds, we are silent. And silence in the face of evil is complicit with evil itself. All that's necessary for evil to triumph is for good men and women to do nothing. We're men and women of substance. We've been created in the image of God. We've been fearfully and wonderfully made, knitted together in our mother's womb. We're more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. I struggled over the accusations of pastors around the country who, who sent me scathing letters that I was in defiance of Matthew 22 and Romans 13. Well, I came across the writings of a minister who died in 1766. Jonathan Mayhew. He was beloved. Beloved by our founders. He died in 1766, never saw the birth of this nation. But a man of substance, by his words, formulated the nation you now sit in and hold in your hand the scriptures that are so powerful, transform the known world. A book that has been sought to be outlawed, silenced, and removed from society. Benjamin Franklin so adored Jonathan Mayhew's writings, so influenced by him and Whitfield. When it came time to establish the seal of the United States of America, where it now says e pluribus unum, he wanted a different seal. And he had taken it from a sermon given by Jonathan Mayhew. And this is the seal that he had described wanting to have. This rendition was done in the 1800s, and they failed to accomplish what Franklin wanted. And you'll see momentarily why, but this is the best rendition we could come up with. The writing is correct. The picture isn't. Rebellion to tyrants is obedience to God. That's what our seal was supposed to be. Some of you go, ooh, I, that's just not scriptural. In the story of America's Great Seal, a particularly relevant chapter is the imagery suggested by Benjamin Franklin in August of 1776. He chose the dramatic historical scene described in Exodus where people confronted a tyrant in order to gain their freedom. Franklin's design was recommended by the first committee for the reverse side of the great seal. No sketch was made of their design. The above drawing was made by Benson J. Lossing for Harper's New Monthly Magazine in July of 1856. Note, Lossing failed to include something Franklin specified. Rays from a pillar of fire in the clouds reaching to Moses. Thomas Jefferson, in addition, liked the motto, rebellion to tyrants is obedience to God. So much, he used it on his personal seal. Also, it seemed to have inspired the upper motto on the final reverse side of the great seal, Anuacopetus, God has favored our undertakings. Where did it come from? Him, Jonathan Mayhew. As I said before, he died in 1766. He wrote a sermon that moved Caesar. Formulating and creating the freest government in the history of the world. 
This is a sermon. Hard to read. It's a discourse on unlimited submission. He gave it on January 30th, 1750. He stood in the pulpit of the West, Old West Church in Boston, preached what was to become one of the most famous sermons in history. The occasion was the 101st anniversary of the death of King Charles I. The challenge that Mayhew addressed before his congregation was the question of whether rebellion against a tyrant was a violation of the Bible's command in Romans 13 for Christians to submit to political rulers. In a sermon eloquently entitled, A Discourse on Unlimited Submission and Non-Resistance to the Higher Powers, Mayhew argued that the command in Romans 13 is not absolute and does not apply to tyrannical rulers. He compared this command with the commands for children to obey their parents, servants to submit to their rulers, and wives to submit to their husbands. Mayhew argued, for example, that the command for children to obey their parents does not require children to submit to being killed if their father has gone mad and is trying to murder them. And I would add that if a father were trying to murder his children, any older child with the ability to stop him would have the duty to do so with whatever force is necessary, amen. Mayhew reasoned that this limitation to the command for children to obey their parents applies just as much to the command for Christians to submit to their government. We want you to kill Jews. Do you obey? Well, you say that. The Christian nation of Germany that was responsible for the Reformation and Martin Luther. In 20 short years, all the citizens agreed to do that. They gave the church over to Hitler. They allowed Hitler to say the church was non-essential as long as they took care of the buildings and the pensions. You see, to contend against Hitler, who had risen in power as a thug, and would do anything to retain that power, if you spoke truth, you'd die. Now let's change it. The SS come to your door. Guns pointed at you. Are you hiding Jews? Now the consequences of telling the truth are far different. Why, why would we not tell the truth now when the consequences aren't as heavy? If you don't take the jab, you lose your job. You take the jab in order to not lose your job and now you have established a future for your children that is subject to Caesar usurping your health. Is that rendering unto Caesar what is Caesar's? They come and tell you that if you open your church, you and a thousand congregants or visitors will be cited. Is that rendering unto Caesar what is Caesar's? Is it unlimited submission? Do you just roll over and take it? Jonathan Mayhew and many other, well, let me back up. And the reason why I want to back up is I want to read a couple things and then I'll give you that last slide. Ministers, watchmen on the wall of liberty, according to Franklin Cole, the editor of They Preached Liberty, were among America's greatest revolutionary influences. The most influential was Boston Congre Congregationalist Minister Jonathan Mayhew. Declaration of Independence signer Robert Treat Payne called Mayhew's America's father of civil and religious liberty. Especially important was his January 30th, 1750 address, which was widely printed in red, given for the centennial of Charles I's execution. Mayhew argued that obedience is not the due of, uh, due of oppressive governments because such tyranny violates the divinely instituted purpose of government to benefit the people. And if rebellion against Charles for eviscerating British liberty was justifiable. The same arguments applied to the Americans' loss of liberty under George III. As we speak of Mayhew, reconsider his argument for our liberty, which is safe only when we recognize its fundamental importance. An argument so important that John Adams called it the spark that ignited the American Revolution. Such as really, well, let me drop to here. The duty of a cheerful, conscientious submission to civil government from the nature and end of majesty, magistracy to punish evildoers, but what can be more absurd than an argument thus framed? 
Rulers are, by their office, bound to consult the public welfare and the good of society. Therefore, you are bound to submit to them even when they destroy the public welfare in direct contradiction to the nature and end of their office. Tyrants and public oppressors are not entitled to obedience. He said, no government is to be submitted to at the expense of that which is the sole end of all governments, the common good and safety of society. The only reason of the institution of civil government and the only rational ground of submission to it is the common safety and utility. If therefore, in any case, the common safety and utility would be promoted by submission to government, but the contrary, there is no ground or motive for obedience and submission. Resistance is most righteous and glorious stand made in defense of the natural and legal rights of the people against the unnatural and illegal encroachments of arbitrary power. To exercise a wanton, licentious sovereignty over the properties, consciousness, and lives of all the people. We don't have the luxury of allowing evil to destroy our community. We're Christians, men and women of substance. We don't lose our value. And that value comes that we speak the truth in love and we don't waver in opposition or fear. We stand and contend for what is right that Caesar would be moved into alignment to understand the responsibility that we are not saddles to be ridden by the elite. We're men and women created in the image of God, stamped with the Imago Dei. We have as much rights as anyone else does given to us by God, and that's the purpose of government, is to protect those inalienable rights, period. Now, Christendom doesn't agree with me. Those of you who are fans of the Gospel Coalition, which is funded through subsidiaries, subsidiaries by his George Soros himself, and also the Rockefeller Foundation, which is putting Bible studies together to be promoted in churches to tell Christians to stay out of the public square using cut and paste scriptures to say that we're to render unto Caesar what is Caesar's and to obey all those in positions of authority, taking all out of context and not exegeting the text itself. So when they come across someone so profound as to have been instrumental in swaying Caesar to establish the freest government on the face of the earth, they cannot contend with his brilliance, so they do what everyone does who can't win an argument. They go after the ad hominem attacks, attacking the person, not debating the issue. And if you start to debate with them, they need their safe space. Because it's not about truth, it's about retaining power and they want to silence you because they're useful idiots who are not educated but indoctrinated and they're slaves of the elite. They'll be the ones who will be eaten last. The Gospel Coalition, one author for the Gospel Coalition wrote these words of Jonathan Mayhew. Jonathan Mayhew, many other American ministers, traditionalists and liberal alike, help feed paranoia about the threat to American liberty that Noel, who's the author of a book that was written about, uh, uh, contrary to of Jonathan Mayhew, he says, Liberty, that Noel, as a Christian historian, finds unfortunate and unseemly. They help make the American Revolution and the bloody civil war in British America more likely. They called it a British civil war. War usually needs sacred sanctions of some kind in order to sustain people's motivations for it. Surely there are some cases the fight against Nazi tyranny in World War II comes to mind where ministers can make a strong case for offering such sanction. But was the American Revolution such a case? And Noel goes on to say, no, I doubt it. He's writing this in America. He can go to any country he wants and he, he says that we've been illegitimately created by a preacher that was off center and unbiblical. He has no proof of that and no way to prove it. But who cares? It's about power. And they've got the money coming in and all they have to do is write articles to sway you away from the public square and contend for your neighbors. 
They label you with ad hominem attacks as Christian nationalists. All they have are names. But the question remains, as the dollar that's made of paper continues to be worthless, more and more so, are you men and women of substance who increase in value through the refiner's fire and the trials of life to stand without wavering or fear, to contend for truth no matter the consequences. You, you, if that be you, will never lose your value. You'll become more and more precious. And when you step into glory, you will lay those crowns of gold at the feet of the one who called you into such glorious service. This life is temporary. Don't hold on too tight. Contend for truth. You're not in charge of the outcome, but the obedience. God sees you. He knows you're scared. He says, come to me if you're burdened with that. My yoke is easy, my burden's light. You won't count any of these things dear because you are the precious one. Having done all, stand. You're immovable. The apostle Paul said as he was kicked through the streets like a soccer ball, none of these things move me. None of them. That's you. That's the folks that are tuning in across the world because the land in which they reside, they can't find a church. They would love to be able to hold your hand and greet you and give you a, a brotherly hug. They can't. They support what we do. But do you understand you're not alone? Just look at the numbers. And the thing that I enjoy the most are the, the derogatory comments in the live chat. That means they're watching. We got this. Keep your eyes on the Lord, the author and finisher of your faith. We render unto Caesar's what is Caesar's, recognizing that his image is on the coin, but if he contradicts that which God commands, <laughs> I got a print of God, and I'm his, and Caesar is not going to take what rightfully belongs to God, ever, in Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand. Let me pray for you. The long one, thanks for enduring through it. Lord, to realize as you go on to write in Matthew that governments will be judged. No government is to be submitted to at the expense of that which is the sole end of all government, which is to protect our inalienable rights, the common good of society. Men and women created in the image of God children and trust, trusted to us as stewards that belong to you. Truth, which should be freely accessed without censorship or propaganda. Lord, I, I pray that we would contend in the public square. We thank you for our founders who contended with Caesar to establish the freest nation on the face of the earth and even if confused citizens of Christendom declare it to be an unjust revolution while they enjoy the freedom to exercise their religious freedom in a nation they decry as illegitimate, we still stand realizing that they are not the enemy but the opportunity. We pray, Lord, for our neighbors that we as men and women of substance would not be moved or frightened by Caesar, but we would always stand for truth. In Jesus' name, amen.